Back in 2016, I was on a flight to Nashville. It was a storm that forced us to do an emergency landing in Atlanta. I was shuffling around with my bag trying to find a way to get home, but it was the middle of the night. There was a single bus available and it was heading the wrong way, Jacksonville. My options to get home were quickly running out. So I just went for the first possible option, renting a car. A lot of other people had apparently thought the same thing. I ended up in a queue and by the time I reached the counter, clerks were already apologizing and closing. They had nothing left to give. I just slumped down in my chair with my phone trying to figure out a plan C. About half an hour later, a lady behind the counter called out to me. Apparently there was a customer who booked a car but hadn't checked it out. It was up for grabs if I wanted it. Of course, I took it. I was a bit stressed. I hadn't had anything to eat and it was close to 2 a.m. I was going to have to drive through the storm and I wouldn't be home until, at best, early morning. It was going to be a long night. I got a forest green Chevrolet Equinox. Looked good enough. I was going to have to check it in once I got to Nashville, but I could probably walk from there or take an Uber. I signed off on all the papers, threw my bag in the back, plopped down in the driver's seat and buried my face in my hands. I was already exhausted, but you gotta do what you gotta do. I stopped at a gas station on my way out of town. Not to fill up on gas, it was full already, but to get myself a quick snack and something heavily caffeinated. I made a checklist in my mind, trying to count the hours it would take me. The I-75 to Chattanooga, then the I-24 to Nashville. I was looking at about a four hour drive, but considering the weather, I was probably going to have to slap another 30 to 60 minutes on top of that. I stocked up on snacks, got back in the car, turned on the radio and hoped for the best. It was only droplets at that point, but the wind was picking up fast. Even then, I could feel it push from the northeast. There was this constant pressure forcing me to compensate. I felt that driving just a little too fast might make the wheels completely lose grip. The rain picked up as I passed through Marietta. The wipers were doing their best, but it was getting rough. I could barely see anything ahead. I was tuned in to some calm piano music, but all it did was make me sleepy. I had to be focused. I had almost no time to react if anything were to step onto the road. The first half hour getting out to Atlanta was strange. I was still adjusting and I think I was more tired than I realized. At one point, I thought I saw two people just off the side of the road, holding a stop sign. At another point, I thought I saw a literal car wreck coming down the opposite lane. There was a pickup truck where I couldn't even see the driver. There's just something about blurred movement in the dark rain that makes our brains fill in the blanks, I thought. But I was warm and safe. I took my time. I did periodic stops and I made my way northwest at a steady pace. Two hours in, I stopped in Chattanooga. The rain was going strong. I was basically traveling along the path of the storm. I stopped to use the bathroom and stretch my legs. Getting back in my car, I turned up the radio for a bit and reached for a Slim Jim. Except, there was no Slim Jim. Strange. 
I'd carefully counted everything out for the trip. I was going to have a snack at the halfway point and a soda upon my final arrival. But my snack was gone. Again, it came back to uncertainty. Maybe I was being a bit ditzy about it. Maybe I'd already eaten it. Or maybe it just rolled between the seats. But I couldn't see it and I was pretty sure to myself. As I pondered where I put it, a new song played on the radio. Don't worry, be happy. How fitting. I was just about to put the key in the ignition and leave when I got a text message. It was from the car rental place. They were asking me to return the keys as I hadn't checked out my vehicle. What? I just stared at the screen for a bit. There must have been some kind of mistake. I was sitting in the vehicle right then and there. I was holding the key. It didn't make sense. I tried to text them back, but it was some sort of automated number. I figured I'd just talk to the folks when I returned in Nashville instead. It would probably clear things up. I thought about going back inside and getting a new Slim Jim, but I couldn't be bothered. I fired the car right back up and headed for the I-24, putting my phone on mute for a bit as Don't Worry, Be Happy came to an end. Odd how the song came on in the first place, considering the station I was listening to was supposed to only play classical. I followed the road west, periodically looking down at the GPS. As the rain intensified, I realized I couldn't keep spending time looking away from the road. So I put the voice guide on, I turned my brain off, and just followed the instructions for a bit relaxing to the music. Then I saw a sign. Trenton. I was going the wrong way. I had to pull over at a rest stop. I'd gone about 20 minutes in the wrong direction. The storm was picking up, and during that short stop I saw no less than two lightning strikes. The rumble vibrating through me, making my bones itch. I got back in the car, trying to figure out the GPS. I wiped the water from my eyes, trying to swipe the screen with wet fingers. I was so frustrated that I remember complaining out loud, come on, come on. For some reason, the GPS had been set to Langston, Alabama. If I had followed the directions to a T, the car would have ended up at the bottom of Gunterville's Lake. I didn't even notice how the radio had started playing Don't Worry, Be Happy. I just caught the last few notes as it ended. Getting back on the road, I knew I had to take a hard left to get back on track. I waited for a spot. Take a right. It repeated. I was so frustrated that I laughed a little. I signaled left and got ready to turn, but the turn signal bounced right back up to neutral. I pushed it down again and it bounced right back a second time. Finally, I just went with it. Turn signal or not, I was going left. As I finally made my way back to the I-24, I had to completely ignore the GPS. It was asking me to stop, to turn, to switch lanes, anything but going straight, which was my destination. I just turned it off. The thing was clearly broken. I thought it had some kind of pre-saved destination that it defaulted to and then I had to set up some kind of profile to fix it. Finally, back on the right track, I was coming up on a truck that had slowed down. As I turned to pass it, my headlights suddenly turned off. I managed to get out a, huh? Before I heard the whir of the engine dying. 
Then it all went dark. The car just died. Other cars had to pass me, throwing themselves on the horn. I was barely visible. A dark car in the middle of a highway at night in the full rain? It was a disaster waiting to happen. I slammed the dashboard, turning the key over and over again. Not a peep. Nothing. I took the key out, cleaned it on my shirt, swore a little more, and then the car started. I was still holding the key. Slowly, I put the key back in the ignition. Not that it seemed to matter. I blinked a couple of times, not really knowing how to process this. Either way, I had to get going. I couldn't just stand still in the middle of the highway. Thank God I wasn't rear-ended. As I got back on the road, the GPS kicked up again. It was getting more decisive, giving me not only general directions, but distances. Repeated reminders over and over. I turned it off, but a couple of minutes later it came back on. It wasn't sudden or even surprising at that point. The logo came back on screen and then it was right back to the map telling me where to go. I tried to ignore it, but it was getting harder. The radio would turn down with every reminder, so it would pull me out of whatever I was listening to. It seemed that no matter my intention, the car was hell-bent on going to Guntersville Lake. Not going, I muttered to myself. I'm going home. The headlights blinked, almost as if responding. I shook my head. It's just me, I continued. It's all me. And again, the headlights blinked. I had to slow down as a truck passed me. The radio had gone quiet, and I expected another GPS reminder. But nothing came. Instead, I heard some kind of muffled noise. A low hum. What? I mumbled. The low hum returned a second time. I couldn't quite make it out. I just shook my head, trying my best not to think about it. But the third time I heard it, I couldn't ignore it. Please turn. It was coming from inside the car. It was hard to say exactly where. Maybe inside the trunk or the glove compartment? I almost swerved off the road in surprise. The realization that there was a real, actual voice somewhere in the vehicle. Someone was in there with me. I had nowhere to pull over, so I kept my head straight, focusing on the road ahead. I could feel my chest pounding as my mind rolled over trying to figure out what was really happening. Maybe it auto-connected a call or something. Maybe it was someone calling through the GPS. Who said that? I wheezed. Who's there? I'm with you. It answered. I'd like to see the lake. I'm... I'm going to the city. After that, you can... Do whatever you want. It needs to. A short pause. It rains. It was a mumble, but it was getting clearer. An ambiguous voice, possibly a young man. It was hard to tell. They never picked me. It continued. They were supposed to pick me. I'm not sure what... What you think is happening here, I said, but I have no idea what you're referring to. This has nothing to do with me. You're going to the lake. I can drop you off right here if you want, but I'm not going anywhere else. This, this is my car. I paid for it. There were a few seconds of quiet as if contemplating a proper response. 
The mumble turned sour, more aggressive. Can't be bought. The car began to steer left. I had to keep pulling to the right to avoid hitting the divider. The rain was already intense, and I was going at a high speed. Any sudden movement could have devastating consequences. Other cars were honking at me, trying to warn me that I was turning back and forth erratically. As resistance in the steering wheel increased, I found myself straining to bend the wheel back to the right. Then all resistance just stopped. I couldn't move the wheel any way I wanted. Problem was, the car wasn't responding. It kept going to the left, now out of control. As the car started to spin, there was a sequence of thumping noise, as if something heavy hit the asphalt. Then I got that feeling in my gut like I was falling from a great height. Another thump, a blink of the headlights, and we were in the opposite lane going back to where we came from. Except the car was still heading off-road. I was just holding on for dear life at this point. I tried to hold the steering wheel straight, but it did nothing. There was no control. Broke the contract. It kept mumbling. They broke the contract. There was this rhythmic thumping on both sides of the car as it kept steering towards the edge of the road. Other cars were passing by, swerving desperately to get out of the way. One of them clipped the taillight, and for a second I thought I'd see my life flash before my eyes, but somehow the car kept going, straight off the road. I thought it'd be a big crash. The roadside was uneven, leading into a field, and yet the car went straight into it seemingly without issue. I could see something moving just outside the driver's side window. With every rhythmic thump, something moved, and beyond the sound of my pounding heart, there was something else. The GPS had gone completely mad by now, repeating, Straight ahead. Over and over on repeat, but there was another sound. I pressed the brakes and the gas, and nothing happened, but as I pushed the gas, I heard something. The wheels were spinning. They weren't touching the ground. I let go of the steering wheel. It didn't matter anymore. I was coming to the realization that I wasn't even in control anymore and reached for my phone. The moment my call connected to the emergency services, the radio started to shriek to the point where I thought my ears would bleed. Not a single word got through. The car was going past the field and into the forest. I was going way too fast, but it managed to dodge and weave through the trees with only minor bumps. I was being tossed around like on a roller coaster. Finally, at a sharp turn, my head hit the steering wheel. I didn't exactly black out, but I think I had a concussion. I just sort of zoned out. By the time I came to, I heard a gulping noise. The hood of the car was submerged in water. I was sinking. We were at Gunterville's Lake. After a bit of clicking, I managed to get the seatbelt off and tumbled out the door. My face hit the dirt with a thud, and I could smell lake water and reeds. I crawled away, trying desperately to keep the world from spinning. Something warm was running into my eye, which made me realize that I was still bleeding from the head. Gaining some distance from the forest green Chevrolet Equinox, I realized a couple of things. One, that the wheels seemed to have come off. They were leaning out of the wheel hub. And two, the car wasn't sinking into a lake. 
It was bending down, as if drinking from it. I know what you're thinking. I had a head wound. I was exhausted and sleep deprived. While all of that is true, that doesn't change what I was experiencing. It was leaning down and the gulping noise sounded exactly like drinking. I just looked at it, confused. I noticed something moving with the wheels leaning down. There was something else moving around in the wheelhouse. Just like I'd seen something moving with that rhythmic thumping earlier, I came to suspect that there was something just out of sight. It didn't take long for my suspicions to be realized, as a claw-like appendage extended from underneath the metal hull, like a combination of serrated beetle pincers and a scorpion stinger, but with a soft white shell. It squeezed itself out, lifting the car like the shell of a crab as two massive headlights turned towards me. I could hear that voice again, this time coming from under the hood, still muffled. You live, it said. And for a brief moment, none of us seemed to know what to do. I could hear a cockroach-like clicking coming from under the hood, as if a appendage strained against the metal. I turned only to see more headlights peeking through the distant tree line. There was the sound of shuffling grass as something large moved through the field. I wiped the rain water from my brow and squinted, forcing my eyes to focus. An electric moped crawling on all fours a spider-like delivery truck, and further off, bounding through a field, a six-legged pickup truck. I stayed very still as the various vehicles moved closer, close enough for me to hear the rain pitter pattering against their metal frames. They were moving much more organically by now, having mixtures of humanoid and insectoid limbs. The metal was groaning as they shambled back and forth. It was a surreal experience. Not only were they communicating in some sort of insectoid clicking, but they were also using their vehicle characteristics Doors, alarms, radios, trunks, seats, and windows opening, closing, and moving to accentuate their communication. I was nothing but a meaningless bystander. I think they forgot about me for a moment. I stayed completely still for probably about an hour or so. My body was trembling from the cold and the head wound. I had considered all my options over and over in the back of my mind. There was no way to outrun them, so maybe I could just wait them out. Then again, that was a roll of the die. As soon as they got a reminder that I was even there, they might deal with me immediately. The best thing I could do was to move, slow and steady, ready to burst into a sprint if necessary. Still, with the way my legs wobbled and my head spinning, I wasn't confident. Slow and steady, that had to be the ticket. As soon as the vehicles circled one another, metal groaning as they shifted through the reeds, I crawled along the edge of the lake. I made it about 20 feet before the electric moped turned my way. There was a cacophony of screeching noises as the ground around me lit up like a Christmas tree. 
My pulse shot through the roof. I threw myself into the lake, hoping for the best. If I had been cold before, now I was freezing. I was submerged completely, feeling my clothes weigh me down. I had to struggle to even breach the surface. Swimming further out, I noticed the headlights staying by the beach. They were looking my way, lighting up the water around me, but not following. For a moment, I thought I'd done the right thing. That all I had to do was keep going and I'd be in the clear. But a thought hit me. Why had they come here? And why were they gathering around this particular part of the lake? It didn't take long for an answer to surface. Something brushed against my feet. Something small and fast. I could see little white crab-like creatures rushing past just beneath the surface, poking at my legs and feet as if to test me. And far down in the deep, something moved. The water shifted, pushing me away. I started swimming. My head felt like it'd come loose like an empty glass bottle rolling on the floor of a bus, clinking back and forth. I was not okay, and I started to realize that there was a very real possibility that I might just drown. A great wave pushed me. I drifted about 40 or so feet as something massive made its way out of the lake. It looked like an abandoned train car, probably from the late 40s or so. Paint long since stripped and roof covered in algae. The glass windows were long since broken off the hinges, watching it step out of the lake with water spilling out the broken doors was unreal. There seemed to be some sort of discussion, a scolding, perhaps, as the larger one screeched and pushed the smaller vehicles, like an alpha wolf trying to see if anyone was brave enough to step up for a challenge. Minutes later, I saw the forest green Chevrolet Equinox moving away. Headlights scanning the high grass as the hood popped. Even at a distance, I could hear that voice again, clearer now. Come out, it called. Please come out. By then, I had drifted ashore about 60 or so feet south, pushed by the waves. I'd crawled into the reeds, resting my head against a large rock. I couldn't move anymore. The shakes had turned into fatigue. Even if I wanted to, I couldn't. Come out, the voice repeated. Come out now. I couldn't. I just lay there, hypothermic, and waited. But nothing came for me. The green Chevrolet Equinox scanned the area. It searched, but it couldn't find me. It was growing increasingly panicked, its voice becoming shrill and animalistic. The others circled it. Come out, it repeated. Please, please, come out. Then a horrifying screech. It blared out this distorted version of, don't worry, be happy. They reminded me of a dying bird. It was like dragging a knife along a guitar string, followed by rusted metal bending at unnatural angles. Steel against steel, crunching, groaning, tearing. Headlights blinking and sweeping over me as the voice turned to a scream. Please! Please! It begged. 
Then, nothing. By then, I was barely conscious. A slow parade of a pickup truck and electric moped and a delivery truck rolled away in the distance. And finally, a train car lifted by a hundred little arms moving like a centipede. It stopped next to me. Seeing it up close, I could notice more details. Black, shark-like eyes peeking through the cracks in the sheet metal. Worm-like appendages holding plates together as a shield. A thousand micro-movements just beneath the surface. This was a living hive, a creature parading as something else. But it didn't care. A hundred little beady eyes looked my way, but it had already made up its mind. Or maybe it thought I was done for. Long after the thump of the vehicles had passed, I crawled forward. I had reeds and flowers stuck to my hair. I think I swallowed a couple of blue petals from a sunflower along the bank of the lake. I found the remains of a green Chevrolet Equinox. The top and windshield of the car had caved in, and there were long tears in the side of it, like battle wounds on a dead animal. Parts of the engine lay scattered in the dirt. It was half submerged, but I could reach into the driver's seat. The door was gone. I waved my arm around, searching desperately for something I knew to be there. And thank God I found it. My phone, buried under the remains of the busted glove compartment. I have no memory of my call for help, but I can't imagine it was coherent. The EMTs found me hypothermic and concussed, leaning against the car. They said I must have been hit by a large vehicle and concussed, kept driving into nowhere. They had no idea about where I got the car from, though. The rental was still back in Atlanta. I didn't have any answers. It's been a few years, and I've recovered. I was in a rough space back there, and I'm sure that was the most dangerous moment of my life. I saw something I wasn't supposed to, but it has also made me question things that I've seen since. There are several articles that I've read about vehicular accidents that just don't make sense to me. Situations where cars have seemingly gone out of their way to crash or kill. I'm sure you've seen a couple too. But there are other things too. Some of the posts I've read on here speak about inanimate objects taking on a seemingly conscious intelligence. Could it be that it's not all just make-believe? Hell, those things... I felt in the lake were no larger than a hand. I'm sure they could use something as small as a computer as a shell if they wanted to. I don't know... I don't know what to think. I don't know what to trust. But I know for sure there is something living right under our noses. And I don't think... There's anything being done about it.